Welcome everybody to the 18th online cultural majlis. It gives me great pleasure to host um, our speaker tonight, who's speaking to us from uh, California in the US, where it is still quite early in the morning. So I really appreciate it, uh, Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed is a, a colleague and a friend, and uh, I've hosted him a number of times uh, at uh, Yale University, as well as in Washington, DC. Uh, so he is, um, quite known uh, to a lot of us here and those uh, who know his work. Uh, he will be properly introduced by my colleague, uh, Reem Khurshid. So uh, Reem is a UAE-based uh, architect and researcher uh, holding a bachelor's degree in architectural engineering and technology from Cairo University. She's actually joining us from Cairo, even though she is based in the UAE usually. Uh, she's the lead researcher on the forthcoming publication, Building Sharjah and uh, Reem will be introducing um, Mohammed Shahid today. Um, thank you, Sultan, for the introduction and invitation to introduce uh, today's speaker, whose book and research uh, are about Cairo, the city I was born and raised in, and one of my favorite city cities, probably. Uh, speaking today is Mohammed Shahid, a curator, writer, and architectural historian, focusing on modernism in Egypt and the Arab world, he is the founder and editor of Cairo Observer, an online platform uh, discussing the architectural and, and urban discourse in Egypt. In spring 2020, he taught a course um, on curating architecture, design, and material culture in the Middle East at the Kavokian Center at NYU. Shahid was the curator of the British Museum, uh, Museum's Modern Egypt, uh, Modern Egypt Project in Egypt's Winning Pavilion, modernist indignation in the 2018 London design Benelli. In 2019, he was named among Apollo magazine 40 under 40 influential people in the Middle East. Uh, he earned his undergraduate degree in architecture from New Jersey Institute of Technology. He holds a master's degree from MIT, Aga Khan, Program for Islamic Architecture and a PhD from NYU's Department of Middle Eastern Studies. Finally, um, Shahid is the author of the recently published Architectural Guide, Cairo, Cairo Since 1900, one of AC Press's most stunning books since its publication. <laughs> um, I'll be muted and Shahid, you may start. <laughs> um, thank you very much, uh, Reem. Uh, thank you very much, Sultan, for uh, inviting me again and um, for showing off the book. I'll, 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 I, I won't be talking too much about the book today, but I'll. I'll show it really quickly. Um, <clears throat> so the book I just want to point out has uh, 226 buildings. Um, and this is a very small percentage of potential buildings that can be included um, in the history of modern architecture when we're thinking about uh, the city of Cairo. Um, so let alone imagine how small that um, selection of buildings uh, is representative really of the, the larger picture of modernism, uh, architectural modernism in Egypt. Um, one of the things I just want to point out really quickly, sort of, uh, I, I'll try not to talk for more than 15, 20 minutes, um, but a couple of points uh, before the uh, 1952 uh, sort of military Nasser project, Egypt had some level of centralization, but it wasn't as centralized as what happened after 1952. What that meant is the different cities had some level of autonomy and uh, their own sort of elite class that built a lot of commissioned quite a bit of architecture. So all of the different um, provincial cities all across from the Delta to the Said to, of course, the Suez Canal, which has a special uh, situation, really have their own um, history of, of, of modern architecture. Um, unfortunately, uh, much of this has already uh, disappeared. Um, so what I'll try to do today is to sort of get you interested in some of the possibilities for understanding the history of modernism beyond Cairo, but also its potential for uh, the wider picture of the Middle East. And I'll start with just showing um, some of the activity that I've been uh, posting on uh, their Cairo Observer Instagram page. This is uh, an interior from a residential housing project designed by the state um, for Alexandria, unrealized. Um, um, you know, I've been sharing a lot of material quite openly, and I think this is a good way to instigate a conversation. That was um, a 1900 uh, house in Helwan. This is a housing project by Sayyid Karim, an Egyptian architect, but it's for Baghdad in 1948, 47, 48. This is a house in Beirut, but by a Cairo-based architect, um, um, Antoine Salim Nahas. Um, and so, as you can see, um, this is an urban plan for a suburb um, 
uh, in Yerevan in Armenia that's founded by the same individual who funded uh, Heliopolis, the first desert um, sort of suburb of Cairo. So already by looking at connections from Egypt, we go to places like Armenia, we go to places like uh, beyond, of course, the borders of, of Egypt, we go to other cities within sort of a network of, of, uh, of practice and of patrons, but there's also cities across in the region. Um, I'm just showing examples from a wider picture that was a cinema in, 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 in Jaffa. Um, and this was a monument uh, that I'll talk about in a second, and as, the, as well as this house. The monument is in the Suez Canal um, area in Ismailia, to be exact, and this house is in Kuwait. Um, the history of modernism in Egypt is quite rich and we know very little of it and we have very little evidence left to really tell the complete story. That last slide was of an, um, Adolf Loos, uh, the famous Austrian uh, architect, um, a design for a department store in Alexandria that was not realized. This is not really part of our wider picture uh, of the history of modernism and sort of the place of Egypt in that larger narrative. Um, and to contrast with that, Alexandria is also a city where the state practiced uh, some interesting, uh, or built some interesting <clears throat> experiments in providing uh, facilities for this for 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 Egyptians to sort of um, maintain its popular, um, uh, well, to maintain the allegiance of, of the masses. Essentially, it built a lot of architecture like this, uh, such as this beach resort in Mamura in Alexandria. So you can see that there is kind of um, already a wide network of locations uh, beyond Cairo when we start to look in uh, just a very cursory look at some. Uh, of the, let's say, examples uh, um, uh, that are outside the city and the, the relationship to either patrons or architects who are uh, based um, in the city. So I'll start with this monument because I think it's quite intriguing. Um, I, I came across this completely by chance. Um, there was a conference um, in Ismailia organized by a French research institute, um, and it was about the uh, artificial patrimony of the Suez Canal. And so, <clears throat> Um, I wanted to find sort of uh, an edge that sort of a an anti-colonial or a post-colonial critique of the urban practices that were happening in the Suez Canal zone. And then I looked through the magazines and I find a, 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 an image of this monument that I had never heard of before. It turns out that this monument was uh, completed in 1930 um, by two, um, uh, by an architect and a sculptor, both French, who won a competition for it. And it's meant to commemorate the defense of the Suez Canal during World War I. Um, so it has two figures, they're quite colossal. Um, <clears throat> one represents enlightenment and the other one is brute force. Um, and I wondered why I hadn't seen it, because Ismailia is quite a small place. And just to give you a sense, um, here's the Suez Canal, Ismailia, you can see the sort of the old part of Ismailia and the new part of Ismailia. And then there's this lake and south of the city, um, here it is. Um, a little speck on the map is the monument. And you can see it's surrounded by um, what looks like an empty, perhaps uh, once it used to be a military camp or something. Uh, but essentially what could have been a centerpiece of uh, a public space is kind of in the middle of this abandoned lot of land. It's really taken out of uh, public knowledge or you know, it's taken out of public life. Um, and so there's this kind of interesting contrast where such a monumental, um, very public expression of something, an idea, um, is made inaccessible by placing it in the middle of this uh, barren desert. And I thought this is kind of a nice metaphor for the larger situation of how we, uh, well, both of Egypt, but also of how we understand modernism in general. There are things that are right there in front of us um, that we have yet to sort of talk about and write about. And this was another example of sometimes when doing the research, you come across a lot of, or at least I come across uh, images that sort of don't have any notations, that don't tell us what, where they are. Um, this was, um, I knew that this is a, a project by Arte Tzai Karim. Um, I wasn't sure of its location. I sort of induced that this could have been in Haram, in, in Giza. Um, and then I posted it on, on social media, I mean, just to sort of put it out there instead of keeping it to myself until I know further. And long and behold, the owner of the house responds and sends me uh, a, a much more <laughs> um, beautiful image of the house soon after construction. And it's now confirmed that the house is in Kuwait and it's still standing. Um, and it is by Saeed Karim. Um, and so my theory that there was two versions of the house, one in Giza and one in Kuwait, is actually probably not true. There's probably only just the one house um, in, in Kuwait. And so um, this is, you know, this is, this is like shooting in the dark of it. You know, you find one thing and you sort of follow it. And 
uh, quickly, well, maybe not so quickly, a, a network uh, that, that extends way beyond a particular city uh, at this given moment emerges. And St. Kerim was very active in Kuwait um, at a certain period. This is um, Cinema Ahmadi uh, on the left. And this is, again, his housing project from a decade er, uh, from two decades earlier for Baghdad. Um, which doesn't really figure into, it has not really entered at all the contribution of uh, an Arab planner into the imagination of post-World uh, post War II Baghdad. It doesn't enter our narrative. He doesn't really, is not really part of it. But just to go back on someone like, say, Karim as a lens through which to look at uh, how modernism pr moves around or proliferates uh, in the region, this is, you know, the, the cinema Ahmadi that was finally realized in the late 60s. Uh, early 70s, and here are two earlier iterations of basically the same design, both for outside Cairo, one is for Aswan on the right, and one is for Mansoura on the left. Uh, neither of them were implemented due to budget reasons, but you can see that here's a Cairo-based architect who is really looking for a new frontier to uh, realize designs, ambitious designs, and he tried it in Mansoura, he tried it in Aswan, it didn't work uh, until someone paid for it and became a cinema in Kuwait. The function was different when it was proposed for those two other cities in Egypt, it was supposed to be a cultural center. Um, and to also look at other um, expressions or other um, projects that were put out there by Egyptian architects or architects based in Egypt that really hint at the, uh, the development of ideas um, and in, in terms of architecture and also planning uh, outside of Cairo. Here is a, an urban plan from 1947, 46-47 um, uh, by an Egyptian planner and it's for Jaffa and you can see here in Arabic it says Tel Aviv. So, um, and then Al Bahl Abiy Mutawassid, Madlis Baladi Tiafa commissioned the plan. So it's a kind of a, a, it's a really interesting moment. Um, and here's something that we only basically have this one published um, a plan for, um, but I think it's, it, it's, it's so critically linked to an important historical moment that we really should invest a little bit more understanding in this. Um, and then we can also look at the African frontier, Egyptian um, um, architects working in different sort of African contexts after uh, sort of with the Pan-Africanism um, that was led by Nasser. This is um, a Hotel de, de l'Amité in Mali, which still exists, it's still sort of the, the main a symbol of sort of modern uh, accommodations. This is where all the UN people and diplomats still stay, uh, the capital uh, of Mali. Um, and again, here's the Adolfo's house. I'm thinking about Alexandria as one obvious example, for example for beyond Cairo. Alexandria is actually slightly more important sometimes. A lot of the firsts were in Alexandria and not in Cairo, um, mostly because of its nature as a port city. Um, and also ironically, uh, there's the least left to physically to, uh, to talk about in Alexandria. Um, I come across um, books and books um, that were essentially catalogs of recent constructions. Uh, that, so for example, these come from um, a kind of a catalog by a construction company showing off the quality of its construction. So it's not by the architects uh, promoting the work. And so I don't even have names for architects or specific dates, um, but I know that this is probably sometime in the late 20s based on other clues in the publication. So there's, again, a lot of like piecing details um, uh, or piecing narratives or trying to identify works um, out of very, very small pieces of, of, of evidence. Um, but still, there are pictures that are found and they should be taken into consideration sort of our expansion of, of, of what modernism looked like. Um, not just in terms of big monuments and projects like hospitals, like this hospital which still exists, um, of course, it's now state-run, it used to be the Greek hospital, but the smaller scale houses that have completely, entirely uh, just disappeared, they still should be uh, an object of study for us uh, today. Alexandria offers really a lot of interesting, um, you know, facets of the development of early 20th century modernism. On the left, you're looking at uh, um, a seaport terminal, a passenger uh, terminal. Um, which is really, as far as I know, is no longer in use, has been terribly renovated, probably lost all of its features. What you're looking at at the top here is um, a drive-through bank uh, that was built in the late 20s in Alexandria. Um, so again, um, and quite an interesting innovative uh, approaches to solving housing issues. None of them, uh, at least the ones that I'm showing you, are like this is not implemented, but it still should um, be uh, 
part of our sort of study. So what I'm trying to propose here is to look beyond Cairo, yes, but also to constantly look at um, both what was proposed and not realized, but also what was built and demolished, because some of them are really fundamentally important to the wider understanding of modernism. So for example, this uh, villa by Ordos Perret. Ordos Perret, his, his work in France has been designated World Heritage. This is a villa he built in 1928, quite you know, early in his, his career. He lived on until the mid 50s, uh, well, mid career, I suppose. And the villa was demolished in 2014. Um, so technically, it doesn't really exist, even though it was in pretty good condition until then. But I think it's an obviously uh, important example of the evolution of modernism in Egypt, but also for the broader region. Um, there's other ways to look, to find a way to sort of expand beyond Cairo as a locale for understanding Egyptian modernism. And, I'm, and I found this figure to be quite interesting. Kamel Amin was a, an Egyptian architect uh, who went and apprenticed with Frank Lloyd Wright. And um, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation recently announced that he passed away this year. Um, and what I found interesting about him is that He's sort of uh, an example of an Egyptian architect who uh, sort of did the reverse uh, journey uh, of not sort of going to study abroad and come back, but he actually established the practice and he participated in important works over there. Like what we're looking at here is um, Elrod House uh, 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 by John uh, Lautner, sorry, it should say John, not own. Um, and, and Kamal Amin was the structural engineer for it, um, and the same for the first Christian church, which was finished after a friend of Lord Wright uh, died. He designed it, one of his last projects. And again, Kamal Amin realized the project as a structural engineer. So there is a way, there's another way in which to sort of complicate the, the network of individuals and places and how they participate in uh, sort of in the making of modernist um, architecture. Um, just to highlight something else, the Suez Canal has its own sort of um, milieu. And what's really important here is to say that there have been three beautiful publications that are essentially cataloging the uh, 19th and 20th century architecture of those three cities. Um, so the, this work has already been done. Mercedes Boulet has been pioneering this uh, along with uh, Christine Piotton from uh, both uh, from Paris. And, and so these, uh, this is kind of already cataloged and pretty well researched, uh, but other parts of the country, for example, this is um, in Asyut. Um, Asyut is in Upper Egypt. Uh, when we think Upper Egypt, we don't necessarily think modernist architecture, uh, but even in, in provincial cities like Asyut, in Minya, uh, definitely in Luxor, uh, definitely in Aswan, um, you know, Tanta even, um, all of these cities have their own, um, let's say, specimens that could be considered seriously within a wider understanding of uh, Egyptian modernism, but the region's uh, modernism as well. And then there's a lot of memory gaps and sort of archive gaps, the individual photos that come up, the, the, the anecdote that someone sort of shares, uh, but with not much else to support it. Um, you know, the, the sort of all the gaps that emerge when we start to do this, uh, this kind of work. Um, and I think um, there's really quite a bit uh, uh, more to do. So I'll leave this sli last slide up. Um, and um, I think, think maybe, I'll, maybe you can open to questions from now, because I wanted to, to, to not run on for too long. But, I, but I'm happy to, to sort of discuss other ideas about sort of expanding beyond Cairo for the study of modernist architecture. Um, thank you, Hamad. I think uh, let's, uh, let's stop your uh, presentation. We can always bring it back uh, in a minute. Um, but once again, I encourage everyone, please let me know. Uh, you can type your question, and if anyone wants to ask a question on video, let me know, and I'm happy to highlight you or spotlight you. Uh, my question uh, to you, Mohammed, is, um, wait, I have to cancel your spotlight. Yes, so um, my question to you, Mohammed, is uh, seeing that there is less uh, intensity in development outside Cairo, does that make, does that mean that modernist structures are safer outside Cairo than they are inside Cairo? Uh, well, actually, it depends on when we're talking. Um, I think the, the, the sort of secondary and tertiary cities um, held up a little bit longer because Cairo faced quite a lot of demographic pressure in the 70s and 80s, and this is when the trend of sort of demolition started. Uh, smaller cities at the time kind of held up a bit more, but now this is, this is not the, the, the case, actually. The, the, the fact is that the provincial cities uh, are, because they're outside of the spotlight, because nobody's looking at them, really, um, 
And because of also a very problematic view that the center, the, the city, the capital is the most important place and everywhere else is not as important. It's seen as that the heritage in those places is not really uh, of the highest quality and therefore shouldn't really be taken to, uh, seriously. But also the financial situation and the economic situation in these cities put a lot of pressure on heritage where people need to, uh, essentially the only assets they have is the real estate that they, that they live in. Um, and so the uneven development within Egypt has sort of forced a lot of these people who live in these beautiful houses uh, or structures that were built earlier in the 20th century to sort of replace them with newer ones for investment. Um, thank you. My second question is, uh, you wrote a lot and, and uh, even helped publicize a very important publication called Al Imara, which I believe was uh, published between the 30s and even the 50s, 30s to the 50s. Uh, how, much of, uh, how much of Al Imara featured uh, architecture and modernity outside Cairo? Or was it uh, mostly a publication targeted to the Cairo and the peripheral area? Yeah, so Al Amara started in 39 and it ran until 59 uh, with 67 issues interrupted, not always uh, at the same consistency. For example, World War II interrupted it quite a bit. Um, and uh, it's really important to say a couple of things here is one, and I want to, because it's a publication that has, uh, that's accessible today, that we still have a record of, uh, we have a very small uh, selection of buildings to consider for this uh, sort of historical period. So it, this is a very curated selection of buildings that we get to learn about. There are other publications that were not as long. Uh, there are other magazines that had a single issue. And then there is, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of buildings that were never published to begin with. So I just want to put this in context that Al Amara is really a drop in the bucket, but it's the one thing that we have access to from this particular period. Um, it did include projects outside of Cairo. Alexandria is present. Uh, provincial cities come up um, regularly. There are urban plans and, and buildings proposed for places like Luxor. Um, and then there is, you know, the the, the Yaffa plan um, was was uh, the Jaffa plan was also published in Al Amara. Um, so we get a little bit of regional exposure, and on top of that, there's reportage on what's going on in Europe and elsewhere. So it it is a very, I would say, and I, I think it's important to remember that Al Amara had regional distribution. So if you were an architect in Baghdad, you hypothetically were able to subscribe to Al Amara and get it uh, to your office. Um, um. And I, I understand that, uh, of course, you were invited by the, uh, is it the Architecture Association in Cairo uh, recently to give a talk about your book? Is it uh, uh, the Maitin study? Sorry? The Maitin Mohandesin uh, that invited the you. Maitin Mohandesin, yes, Society of Egyptian Architects, which is the I first um, yes. professional uh, organization of its kind um, in the region. I mean, one of the things, um, and it's a, it's a really sensitive point because I feel like, um, uh, Egyptians have a bad name for sort of, uh, you know, touting uh, how so important everything in Egypt is compared to somehow everything else, which is not, you know, when I say that it's really important to think about the firsts uh, in the Middle East, it's not because to, it, it, this is not coming from, from a nationalist impulse, it's just out of a genuine interest in our collective history, you know, you know, history wants to remember what's the biggest and what's the tallest, but also wants to remember what's the first and the relationship between you know, object X at a certain point and place, and then sort of how we get to, you know, uh, the more recent constructions in other parts of the region. There's a kind of a, a broader history that, that needs to be completed. So in that context, um, yes, the Society of Egyptian uh, Architects is the first professional um, organization where architects came together to pursue. It's basically Reba for Egypt uh, with a lot less money and not, not a nice building. <laughs> uh, okay, I have a question uh, from Dina Taha who is a recent graduate of the Yale School of Architecture. Uh, Dina, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much, Shahid, for your talk. Um, you talk a lot about modernism and demolition in Cairo, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the rate of demolition that happens in cities like Alexandria, for example. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think what's really important to remember is um, the concept of heritage has always been very shaky um, in, in Egypt. I'm actually writing a chapter right now that's looking at the history of modern Cairo as a history of destruction, as opposed to a history of construction. Um, it, you know, demolition has been really with uh, 
uh, an, an integral part of the city's development and, and sort of modern plan, the introduction of modern plan and modern architecture in Egypt in general, as is the case in, in, in the most general sense. So, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions. For example, one of them is that demolitions um, of pre-1952 buildings uh, were sort of a unique post-1952 practice. That's not the case whatsoever. And by looking at how since the 19th century, uh, you know, building the, 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 the shelf life or the, the life cycle of a building has gotten increasingly shorter. So um, it's, 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 it's not unusual to find that, uh, you know, a beautiful, very heavily invested sort of new Mamluk building was built in 1880 and that it was, de, uh, and that it was demolished in, you know, 1910 or 1911 uh, to make way for you know, a, a wider road or a, a new square. So demolition has always been sort of built in, in, in this way. Um, um, but the pace has certainly increased uh, a lot since the 1990s with, with sort of the liberalization of the economy, but also the arrival of new uh, wealth from people who work abroad. Um, and since 2011, uh, the last decade, it's been, uh, annihilation. <laughs> so let's just not like not kid around and call it something else. Um, there's like there's really so much loss um, uh, that's happening at a surgical level. It's really in incredible, actually. Um, and what I think is uh, important here is to not romanticize a particular era. These are fundamental pieces of evidence for understanding ourselves and our history. And um, you know, this is not sort of a nostalgic. Um, interest in modernism, um, it's a kind of a almost politically engaged um, interest in, in, in really capturing a particular view of the present through architecture. Um, so demolition is, I would say, um, at, at an unprecedented rate, uh, rate uh, and the mechanisms have changed significantly from sort of the form of demolition that was sort of deeply ingrained in the process of modernization from earlier on. Um, and it's also a huge business, um, but yeah, I'll stop here with that. But I'm, I'm writing a chapter on this, so you'll have a whole chapter to read about the topic. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dina, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, next, we have a question from uh, Ali Karimi, who is a uh, Bahrain-based uh, architect, uh, researcher, scholar as well. Um, Ali, go ahead. Hey, th thank you very much, Sultan, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Mohammed. It's always good to hear you talk. And again, congratulate. Oh, I it's funny, it doesn't show nice. that the book is in my hand because of the ba uh, background. Um, <laughs> I mean, it looks on, uh, really visible. <laughs> yeah, 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 congrats on a fantastic book and uh, the wonderful format. And actually, the question is sort of about the format of the book. I mean, one of the things you mentioned, which is so so critical and also so interesting about um, about uh, the, the kind of the Egyptian experience is that it does, uh, especially after the 1950s and in the Gulf, at least after the 1970s, have such a huge part in the architectural narratives of Kuwait Al Bahrain al Saudiya. Um, it's obviously something that doesn't fit within the scope of modern Cairo. But how do you, how can you imagine, like whether it's a sequel or a continuation of these things? How do you kind of bring together these narratives? Is it more of a monographic thing, like you look at three or four major architects, or is it much more um, just saying, okay, this is what's abroad? How do you kind of think of curating, let's say, that way of understanding that, that mm. narrative? So I think I think that I mean the amount of work that's to be done is 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 too much to even fathom at this point. So I feel like if anybody has any particular approach that they'd like to bring in, by all means, please do. Um, but my approach is always to highlight buildings. Um, I mean, I don't want to. I'm consciously trying to avoid, um, uh, let's say, for the lack of a better word, Western art historical tropes that have been quite common in, in the writing of the history of modernism. And I don't necessarily look for figures, for example, to idealize the way um, we're trained about, you know, sort of the history of modernism with idealizing certain figures and uh, sort of I would create a very hierarchical structure of also, you know, locations, individuals. That I'm not trying to do that. So on the one hand, we need to um, really actually have a kind of a, essentially a survey or uh, some sort of index of everything that we can identify. Um, but at the same time, there needs to be sort of the layer of reading. And my approach to reading is to place these buildings in a sort of a political, cultural, economic context always. So if you see the descriptions of the buildings in Cairo since 1900, they're not very much interested in style. They're interested in program. They're interested in sort of 
what we know about certain choices that the architect made to respond to the client if we know that already. So for example, there's a house where I know it's for a single father with three kids. So we know from the description that was published that the architect took into consideration designing the office so that the architect can step in and out of the house through the office without disturbing the rest of the domestic space. You know, that to me is much more interesting than talking about stylistic choices and the use of, uh, you know, style. Um, so that would be the way I would read is to basically build a constellation of individuals and projects that go beyond the glorification of those individuals and, and those projects to talk about sort of a wider network of practice um, and political and economic shifts in the region. I think that's the really fundamental work that, that needs to be done. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, next, I have a question from uh, uh, Bishr Tabba, who is a freelance architect. Go ahead, Bishr. Um, hi, Mohammed. Uh, thanks for the book. It was such a great reference for my latest paper. Um, so I was going to ask, so one of the reasons why Nasser rose to power was because he pushed in the already growing anti-colonial movement. So would you argue that um, he purposely pushed modern architecture to go along with his modern political philosophy? which was mm. characterized by extravagant exhibitionism, socialism, secularism, and so on. And it didn't really reference any history, whether colonial or Islamic. Mm. And if so, why wasn't it seen as Western, given he was Western educated? Modernism came from the West. And mm. how did that work with his pan-Arab narrative? Well, there's a lot in there, so I'll try to sort of kind of attack point by point uh, in a concise way. Um, I mean, I know it's a very appealing argument to say that Nasser intentionally liked modernist architecture. I don't think he was that much of an aesthete. And I think what really happened is that there was a, a professional class that was working in a particular way. And what really changed is a structure of patronage where this class of architects had no one else to really work for since the state sort of emerged suddenly and dominated everything else or even removed the, you know, the, 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 the class that would have been the patrons of, of those architects. So essentially what happened, you had a situation where you have a powerful patron and you had a lot of jobless architects who work in a certain way and practice in a certain way. Um, and then there's the pressure of time where uh, there is sort of the political urgency to build a lot of housing, to create a lot of intervention in the city, to make, uh, to build new uh, institutional headquarters. And so the, the translation between uh, sort of ideas about modernism and how they can apply to a certain vision of Nasserism and socialism, this doesn't really happen. What really happens is a lot of commissions are put out that architects do what they know how to do. Uh, so uh, this was the language of the practice at the time. Um, and it, in sort of Nasser and, and sort of the new state as it became the only patron sort of just adopted it until, it, well, until it ran it to the ground, I would say, because uh, part of the, one of the arguments that I make in my dissertation and uh, hopefully in a, in a project soon is that the, this relation, this toxic relationship between the state as the only patron and these architects who just a few years before were working for, uh, particularly bourgeois kind of um, clientele, um, and the control over the profession and the closure of magazines and publishing outlets and so on, all of this uh, really ran the profession into the ground. Modernism didn't fail, the profession failed and then modernism was sort of just sort of taken out of the picture uh, as, as, uh, as a symptom of that. Uh, the profession was really killed uh, in many ways that I'd say, I think I'd say was still suffering the consequences of this. Um, but this notion that modernism came from the West and this whole West East thing, okay, so, um, because we don't have hours to talk about this. Let's just get one thing kind of out of the way. Um, the age of enlightenment, the age of exploration, uh, you, you know, European elites uh, traveling uh, around most likely the global south, uh, capturing images through whatever means they have possible to them uh, in later on photography, of course, and in the way sort of resources and ideas, and then going back home to build the great cities and empires, that's seen as enlightenment. Um, an Egyptian student goes to, in the middle of nowhere, Midwest, to get a master's degree in architecture, comes back, builds a house, suddenly he's contaminated with the genius of the Midwest, because suddenly, uh, or, or wherever he went, Zurich or Liverpool or wherever. So uh, the, the concept of travel and movement um, 
we've been sort of cultured to think that when, when Europeans, when white people do it, it's enlightenment. When we do it, it's contamination with their ideas. So let's just get it out of the way. This is BS and that's not even a relevant point to, to. and think of the implications of, of this kind of reading on you and me and the many other thousands and millions uh, of Arabs um, who, because of political, cultural, economic circumstance are scattered all across, uh, you know, Western universities, Spain tuitions while they're resuming their classes at home. You know, imagine after all of this, you go home and then they say, you're not really, uh, you know, you're contaminated. Your work is not really, you know, this is BS. We're not gonna accept that anyway, in that, that sort of approach to reading the present. So I don't know why we should project it onto that past. Um, so that said, Nobody owns a claim on modernism. It's a network situation. It's complex. It's messy. Um, and uh, yeah, so I don't think this was ever really part of the conversation of the modernists that were practicing at the time. The Hassan Fatih school comes in later and that sort of changes the conversation. But, but at the moment, these architects are genuinely believing that they're practicing architecture as a sort of a, uh, it's physics. It's physics, it's materials, um, and the aesthetic choices sort of are not the main uh, driving force. Uh, thank you, uh, Shahid. Uh, thank you, Bishop, for your question as well. Next, we have a question from Adam Barron, who is a writer and a political analyst focusing on the Middle East. Uh, go ahead, Adam. Hi. Um, I guess my question, I was initially planning on, on asking something else. My question is focused on kind of Italian-Egyptian interplay, particularly in the 20th, in early 20th century architecture. Mm. Um, what really strikes me in terms of, my family is from Calabria, um, so it always has struck me is the strong comparison between that early 19th century uh, Egyptian architecture um, and sort of the early 19th century architecture you see, particularly in, in urban areas of Southern Italy, uh, most notably, I guess, in, in Reggio, uh, which happened to be destroyed by a back-to-back -back earthquake and tidal wave in 1901. So a lot of the architecture was coming at the same point. Hmm. Obviously, you had a lot of Italians designing buildings in Cairo because of the large community that was there. Uh, but to what extent did you have uh, sort of cross-pollination, so to speak, between uh, local Egyptian architects um, and the Italians that were designing, I mean, a lot of the buildings that you write about in, uh, yeah. in the book? Um, you might have seen on the Instagram uh, account of Cairo Observer, I posted recently about a, a new, Eugenie, Eugene Nusso. Uh, who was an, a, an Italian architect who immigrated to Egypt. And uh, just again, um, you know, uh, just for the sake of uh, clarification for me, you know, Italians in Egypt are immigrants, just like Egyptians when they go elsewhere are immigrants. They're not sort of uh, there to bestow anything in particular. <laughs> That's, uh, they're there to work and they're there to sort of have a, a livelihood. And, and, and most of the professional uh, involvement of Italians in the realm of architecture happened really at two different levels. One is super elite uh, palaces, um, palace architects, uh, architects working for the state. Um, and, and then the other is sort of on the more popular level where Italians sort of hold on to uh, the, the, the realm of construction. So not necessarily design, but construction. And sometimes those two meant the same thing. So it depends on the type of building. Uh, the contractor would simply also be the designer of or the design would happen in-house for a sort of a, a walk-up apartment block that doesn't necessarily, uh, that's like, let's say in a middle uh, income area. Uh, so Italians were sort of involved on those two levels, palaces for the elites, um, uh, architects that we know by name, and then uh, sort of another sort of uh, class of Italians that are working in construction. Um, and then what's, what's really interesting is, of course, the relationship between Alexandria, the Port, Sa the Port Said in particular, and a lot of Italians from the South, the emergence of, uh, of fascism in Italy in the 1920s added to, to, to the population of Italians uh, in Egypt. Um, and so um, Italians and architecture in Egypt actually is an interesting thread because through it you read a, a lot of hardship if you think about it. Uh, for example, Italians during World War I, uh, because of British authorities, were sort of um, uh, taken out of the equation professionally for some time. Again, during World War II, there were internment camps that were in Egypt by the British for Italians who were seen as enemies once uh, Italy entered the war. So construction stopped since Italians control the construction business. So I think there's another way to tell the story of, let's say, the network of of individuals uh, who happen to be Italian, Egyptian, uh, working together in a place like, let's say, Alexandria and Cairo and Port Said and so on, 
uh, that's beyond sort of the idea of influence um, is what I'm trying to say. It's not about, uh, I don't think it's very useful to just sim sort of simplify things as, uh, you know, uh, this influence that. I think it's a little bit more messy and complicated than this. Uh, but certainly there's a lot of contributions uh, on different levels from construction to design. Um, and I, I'd let also to remind people that the founder of Futurism was an Alexandrian Italian uh, that later on went to Italy and became sort of a key figure in the fascist movement. And so we've separated these strands as we sort of untangle history to simplify it into East, West, uh, uh, Europe and not Europe. Uh, we take a figure like uh, Marinetti, who was an Alexandrian, uh, the founder of Futurism, and we don't think of Alexandria or Egypt necessarily when we think Futurism, um, because he's sort of been plucked out of this particular locale and context and plugged into um, sort of an Italian uh, narrative about modernism. Uh, um, but yeah. Thank you, thank you Mohammed. Um, uh, the next question is from uh, Michela Alessandrini who is a specialist in curatorial archives. Uh, she thanks you for your presentation. And she says, I'd love to hear more about archival sources and gaps that you have encountered during your research. And what perspective, if you ever did, did you personally adopt in the question? Um, I think this is a huge, huge work in progress uh, situation. None of the conventions, I feel like um, the approach is, um, the context is really um, scattered uh, and, and the sources are very scattered and the quality is very um, unreliable in many cases. Um, and so, you know, it depends on what you're looking for. And I think this is important because sometimes I don't know what I'm looking for. I didn't know I was looking for that monument in, in, in Ismailia because I didn't know it existed. Um, but I knew I wanted to get out of my comfort zone and, uh, of writing about Cairo and looking at that context at a particular moment, flipping through magazines is usually the first thing I do. Um, the published materials, uh, which are abundant uh, during this particular period, um, are really useful. Uh, but in terms of state archives, for example, very inaccessible. And then there's a lot of material that gets uh, sort of scattered, scattered into private archives with no go-to institution that's able to sort of index or at least list and I think the Arab Center for Architecture is, uh, and I mention them every time, I think they're, they're an important starting point for this, but there has yet to be a sort of uh, a regional entity that is genuinely interested in sort of gathering the resources, the archives, listing them, um, at least identifying who, just like we do this with, in other realms of, of the art world. I mean, why aren't we uh, sort of doing the same with architecture? I'm sure people have, you know, if I didn't post that picture of that one house, um, that black and white picture, I wouldn't have get, gotten that beautiful, um, much more um, detailed colored photo. Um, and so sometimes also putting things out there in terms of the loose bits that we get, sometimes it's a clipping, sometimes it's an advertisement. Um, it, you know, putting it out there gets responses from people who might have actually something to add. So my approach is, you know, it's a work in progress, but I do think that um, every um, every, every detail, uh, every piece that's found should be sort of um, identified uh, to, our, to the best of our knowledge um, and sort of cross-checked with other sources. But uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unfortunate situation. And I think the, the memory gaps in the, given the political context and what's been happening in, in Egypt and in the Middle East over the past century, you know, should not be taken lightly. These are, these, you know, every one of these missing pieces of evidence about the development of you know, this place, uh, what, whichever city we're talking about in the region, um, it's actually really fundamental to understand our present is how I see it. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, the next question is from William Dostuter, who's an architect and urban designer at uh, Harvard. Go ahead, William. Um, hi, hi, Mohammed. It's, uh, it's great to see you. Um, uh, I think uh, you probably saw, probably a lot of people listening to this saw the recent uh, documentary about the removal of the statue of Ramses II in, uh, in, um, in the then Mahat uh, Mahat 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 Ramses. Yeah. And in light of that, and I'm also thinking about the recent transformations or, or latest incarnations of uh, Tahrir Square, I know you don't like talking about style, but can you reflect a little bit upon the uh, legacy of sort of pharaonic history and how that's interpreted in modernism and how that's sort of specific to an Egyptian identity and, and um, you know, beyond just the, uh, the narrative of modernism outside of Egypt. 
Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, I think what's really fascinating is that um, this is an example where having access to precedents uh, would actually be super useful. So, you know, the, the sort of the, pres the place of ancient Egypt in, um, in sort of collective consciousness and how it's seen by architects on the one hand and also clients, potential clients, but also the state uh, as a way to sort of create a, um, a shared identity is something that has a history um, that goes to the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and it's manifested in, in a variety of buildings and, and even battles over style, like for example, the famous battle over what style should the mausoleum of national leader uh, Saad Zaghloul should be, should it be a neo-Islamic style or should it be uh, a, a revival ancient Egyptian a building which might be brand but it also hints at um, well, a pre-Islamic kind of civilization. So how do we uh, negotiate? So there is these kind of precedents in terms of debates and discussions beyond even just looking at precedents in terms of stone and buildings. And so um, I, what I, how I would answer sort of the, the recent, um, uh, let's say, um, attempts to utilize ancient Egypt in a particular way in the public sphere uh, as a formation of sort of some, some kind of identity, uh, it, it's very thin because it's not supported by, it's by sort of Egypt's own modern history of considering the use of ancient Egypt in public space. Uh, it seems to sort of almost be completely unaware of its own history that, that in the intervention. So I think that that's sort of how I would approach um, answering that question. And, and it highlights why during, you know, really uncovering the, 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 as much as we can the details of what was going on earlier in the 20th century. I mean, it's, it's insane how we have a huge blind spot in the 1970s, for example, in 1980s. We have very little access to information, which is much more recent than earlier in the 20th century. Does that mean ancient Egypt didn't sort of appear again during the 70s uh, in one form or another? I'm not sure, but the fact that we don't have the evidence yet doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And I think this is a critical point. Thank you, Mohammed. The next question is from uh, Ahmed Gubba, who is joining us from uh, Singapore. Ahmed just graduated from Yale and US uh, with honors. Congratulations, Ahmed. Ask your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, for uh, for the talk. It's very interesting. Um, you mentioned earlier that the state was almost the only patron uh, from the Nasser time onwards. And as someone like who grew up in Egypt, like one thing I noticed is that it's very easy to say to tell which president's era the, the a building was built under. So I was wondering if like you, with the regime change, there was an increased rate of demolition or whether like a new president wanted to show off better architecture, whether when you were studying uh, Egypt during that time, uh, you saw any, any effect of that, uh, of these regime changes. Yeah. So this is, this is more or less the topic of, of, of my dissertation, uh, which with, you know, with, with time now with quarantine, I'm already thinking about um, that project of how to turn that into a book since I've postponed it for so long. But, um, <clears throat> um, well, yes, more investment in architecture. Uh, and like I said, there wasn't necessarily a stylistic choice. Uh, econ economic questions were much more present, especially in, in the beginning, early 50s, you don't see a lot of debate around how much things cost. But later in the 50s and early 60s, uh, as the economic situation worsens, design is actually so much more informed by economic uh, limitations than it is by these sort of conscious stylistic choices. So I think that's really important to, to, uh, to remember. But in terms of the rate of demolition, um, you know, the state was demolishing before and after 1952. Um, you know, one of the most iconic moments after the end of World War II is, uh, is King Farouk uh, going to Tahrir Square, or, or what became Tahrir Square, uh, in military uniform and ordering the demolition of the military barracks that were built by his own family as an Egyptian military barracks, but were occupied by the British since 1882 until 1947. So in 1947, this was a sort of a symbol of colonialism, a massive building that occupied such a huge part, uh, an important part of the, the, the city center. Uh, and so it, there was a performance of, uh, of ordering demolition uh, as a political act, not just one to create a new space for something else to replace it. At the time, there was no intention to replace it with one thing or another. They just wanted to get rid of the symbol. So this is happening before 1952. 
After 1952, we see the same kind of practice where, for example, the Anglican church, which uh, was built only in the 30s. Uh, so that, that, this, is, this is one of the most fascinating things about studying uh, modernism in Cairo. Buildings appear and disappear in such short spans of time. It's incredible. So a whole neo-Gothic church appears in images from the 30s and disappears completely uh, you know, by the 50s. Uh, an elaborate building that looks like it would have just been there for hundreds of years if it was somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, that was a church that was demolished because it was uh, uh, a British church. There was no, there was no, there was no Anglicans in, in Cairo besides essentially what British soldiers that administrated. So it was a political act to, you know, this was for the October Bridge, uh, the infamous October Bridge. You know, they could have made the bridge go somewhere, you know, different. They could have avoided the church if they wanted to. But it was a political, I think, intention to sort of uh, erase a certain uh, feature from the landscape. Um, so demolitions have been integral um, and they've been politicized. And this is why when remembering that moment in which demolition is politicized, besides the sort of everyday form of demolition, it's really useful to think about what's going on now. Because right now, when we try to analyze the present, our tools are really limited and having historical precedents gives us something, uh, sort of empowers us with something to talk about the present in a sort of more aware way. So this is, so yeah, I would just, I would leave it at that. Thank you, Mohammed. I have a question from Omar Aram, who was studying civil and structural engineering at the University of Liverpool. Uh, he, he asked a question that you touched upon uh, earlier about how exactly and in, one, in what terms was the work of Sayyid Karim, the Egyptian architect, influenced by the political scene during the Nasser era specifically? So um, I, I would say, again, uh, the relationship was the other way. Uh, I don't think the Nasser era influenced as much as uh, the Nasser era found use for what he was already doing. He was a very ambitious architect. Um, and from, from the 1930s, he's been writing publicly about wanting a big patron, uh, about his frustrations with uh, you know, inability to, to, to sort of uh, build things on a grand scale that really requires a patron bigger than someone who wants to build a house. Uh, so he's been kind of excited, I would say, by the rise of the single patron as the state of the 50s. And he approached the Nasser regime repeatedly. So Medinat Nasr uh, is one of many, many projects that, were, that came out of that sort of uh, attempt to foster a relationship with the state. Um, so again, style doesn't really work in that way. It's not politicized in this way. We're trained to think that uh, um, style is always sort of uh, an interface for something that, that it's trying to. A lot of a lot of stylistic, what appear to be stylistic choices, and what I'm looking at, especially when it comes to public buildings in the 1950s, they're practical. Sort of sometimes it's you know there's no uh, there's no um, there's no symbolism really, honestly, beyond that that this is just a plain uh, concrete office building that might have been nicely designed. So I wouldn't overload that uh, aspect of, of what the Nasser regime wanted to do symbolically with, with this kind of architecture. Um, and, and, and just to end, um, Saeed Karim's career ended because of him trying to foster a relationship with the Nasser career so eagerly, uh, you know, at, it didn't work out. And then he, he spent the last 40 years of his life basically uh, unable to work. Um, and he had offices all across the Middle East. Um, we don't know exactly where, but I think uh, from what we can deduce, something in Saudi Arabia or something in the Gulf, but definitely possibly Saudi Arabia, um, and something potentially um, in Kuwait at some point. Um, but these offices were all closed in the 60s and his career kind of ended because of that relationship. Uh, thank you. We have a question from uh, Suha Hassan, who is a, a Bahrain-based architect. She says that, are the movie clips that you have been posting lately on Cairo Observer part of a larger project? I've been always interested in cinema. I mean, I grew up uh, probably uh, appreciating architecture, uh, architecture in Egypt because of um, the omnipresence of Egyptian cinema on TV when we were kids, uh, where art architecture actually played uh, some role in a lot of these uh, films, not just as a backdrop, but as a setting for some sort of mood. And I've noticed this growing up. Um, and I've been wanting to do, you know, a, a few, maybe like almost 10 years ago at this point, sometime right after 2011, I gave a lecture in Cairo about, um, about Cairo and cinema, and I've lost my notes since, and I've been grown crazy. But when I was preparing for that lecture, I found 
uh, such uh, you know abundant material from cinema where the city plays uh, a particular role in 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 the movie, um, and it's represented in a particular way. And this is again forties, fifties, uh, up to early sixties. So modern architecture is really, really present. Um, so I don't have a, a project in particular that I'm working on right now, but I do think, uh, given the archival holes that we suffer from, uh, cinema provides a really interesting insight. And even that is not necessarily accessible. And I like to always remind people of this that. You know, some of the best Egyptian movies are no longer present in Egypt. A private company in another country purchased it a long time ago. And so the archive is not actually even accessible for research. So even when trying to expand beyond the sort of more limited uh, ideas of what the archive should be and looking at cinema, I don't have access to that alternative uh, immediately beyond what's on YouTube. So, um, but yeah, cinema is really uh, something to look at when considering uh, the representation of architecture at the time. Thank you, Mohammed. We have a question from Ahmed Abd Latif, uh, who is an Egyptian uh, diplomat. He says, "Why didn't any of the major world architects of the modernist movement work in Egypt? Bearing in mind, for instance, that Corbusier worked in India, Gropius in Iraq, and Niemeyer in Algeria." Great question. Well, because there was a really strong professional uh, class, <laughs> so there was, um, and they met. Uh, we know, we you know, um, Frank Lloyd Wright had a project. Um, in Ras al Bar, which is not even anywhere near it. So if we're talking beyond Cairo, Ras al Bar is a provincial coastal uh, town outside of Damayetta, where the Nile meets uh, the Mediterranean. So really off the beaten path uh, in 1926. And Frank Lloyd Wright designed a set of six tents, uh, sort of resort tents. Um, that project, uh, I only found out about it by accident. It's in the Frank Lloyd Wright archive. Um, so at least we have record of this. So, so architects of that caliber were present uh, sometimes, occasionally, with some proposals uh, triggered by particular clients. But they didn't really have much room to operate in since there were so many architects. Egypt has been graduating uh, architects in some form since the 19th century and more formally since the early 20th century with professional associations already uh, in existence in the first decade and second decade of the 20th century. So there is really little room for uh, an outsider to come in and impose something. They were invited for lectures. Frank Lloyd Wright visited again in 1957 before he died. Uh, like I showed before, uh, Adolf Loos has this proposal for a department store. Uh, in 1910, the same year, he gave his famous lecture uh, on ornament and crime, uh, which is really interesting to think of uh, an example of something that he designed in a place of Alexandria and how it can help us sort of complicate what we understand of, of his text and lecture um, that's become so important um, and so on. So there were sort of, let's say, crossings. There were presence uh, of some of these big international architects in, in sort of in, in terms of visitation or events. Uh, uh, but yes, not very much practice because of the dominance of the professional class in Egypt. The last three minutes, uh, one question here from Amal Amal Anuhi, who uh, graduated with a bachelor's uh, from of uh, an architecture from University of Arizona. Uh, she asks, "Do you think that the monuments, such as the one you showed, the Monument of Defense in the Suez Canal, should it be part of the urban fabric in Egypt, or should it be a relic like the ones we see the, in the brutalist architecture of Yugoslavia?" Mm. Um, I, I, so I wouldn't put it in that particular bag with sort of that, the, the, it's, a, it's an art deco monument. Uh, so it's a precursor to this sort of Yugoslav brutalist thing that you refer to. I get the, the, the connection, but it's quite earlier. It's a different uh, sort of uh, type of, 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 of design. Um, certainly it should be part of the landscape. I mean, what we are losing collectively as societies uh, again, is not just the ability to walk around well-preserved streets that showcase layers of our, our, our own history. That would be a huge luxury. Uh, and just think, a bit, just think of the amount of investment that cities and states um, across the West put into um, the preservation of, uh, I mean, well, this is now, of course, there have been battles over preservation and, and it's very controversial, the, the research of, on the history of a lot of cities especially when it sort of uncovers something that's not very pleasant, but there's an active institutions that are constantly with staff, with funding, an you know, annual investment in uncovering and understanding and recording and exhibiting and documenting urban environments. This is happening all over the place. And we're not anywhere near that kind of uh, engagement with our own place, uh, with our own places where, where we live. So mon a monument like this, 
if it is not in the middle of an abandoned military camp, but it's actually in the middle of a public space, um, wouldn't that be revolutionary for, uh, for the people of Ismailia to actually have something to talk about that refers to a particular moment that even highlights the colonial history of where they live uh, so that it can begin a conversation. Right now, we're kind of floating in a vacuum. We have so little, so few indicators from the modern period that are highlighted for us in our sort of urban landscape that our immediate engagement with uh, the, the recent past, which actually shapes the moment that we live in today, are, are not there, they're not tangible. And I think this is how you create populations that are easier to rule. So, uh, so yeah, so I think, of course, everything needs to be incorporated into the urban environment and engaged with it in a very active way. Tayyip Mohammed, final question uh, from Shireen Qarawiya, who has uh, just finished her master's in Islamic architecture and urbanism. Mabrook, she's like to know your opinion on how modernity affects identity. Well, read my chapter in your book. <laughs> so so I'm, I wrote a, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a chapter or I'm editing now a chapter um, for a, a book that's uh, basically the result of a, um, a workshop, a conference that, we, that Sultan organized last year that actually touches specifically on this, on this issue. I think um, uh, there's a lot to say here, but let's just say a couple of things in the beginning. I think what, what we collectively need to be doing is investing a little bit less in being reactive and responsive to, um, to Western narratives, uh, critique, uh, Orientalism, um, and invest a little bit more on building a genuine sort of solid network of individuals uh, who can actually um, build uh, or, and, and complicate the material, the narratives, the questions, the issues that relate to architecture and modernity as architecture being just one of the many sort of manifestations of, of, of modernity um, in the region. So spend a little bit less time doing an exhibition to, to impress, uh, let's say, uh, uh, our London friends and do a little bit more to, uh, to, to solidify the, the, the work that's been really happening here uh, across the Middle East for decades, but unsupported. This is really what we need to do. Because I think when we do that, we maybe have a little bit of luck to get outside of the trap of talking about identity and obsessing over identity. Because the other, this, this whole uh, self and other the Orientalist situation uh, has sort of gotten us into this cycle where we're constantly talking about representation and representation means I need to know what I'm representing and so identity and we go into these uh, very shallow I think uh, conversations with regards to architecture that don't really help us uncover um, you know some of the realities that really shape our present again and architecture being one of the manifestations of that so i would i would say that this is a key point because if we uh look at when identity became such an integral part of the conversation in the region of architecture it happens at a very particular political economic moment and so you cannot un really um un un unhinge the two from one another they're kind of linked and so therefore if we want to do away with uh, the dominance of discourse around identity and architecture and modernism uh, in, in relation to identity today, perhaps we should look at the political and economic mechanisms that profit so much from identity being such a dominant uh, lens through which we look at the history of modernism. I don't know if I'm being clear here, but I'm just trying to sort of step us away from that trap. Um, Mohammed Shahid, thank you so much for joining us from California. The book that Mohammed Shahid referenced is co-edited by Professor Roberto Fabri of the University of Monterey and myself. Its working title is Reengaging the Gulf Modernist City. Uh, it should be out next, uh, next year and Mohammed has indeed uh, written a chapter on it that's very, very interesting. So uh, I urge you all to order the book once, uh, once it is available. Uh, in, through whichever channel. Thank you, Mohammed, for joining us. It's so early in California. Yes, uh, <laughs> I'm going to have my coffee now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a nice Thank rest you. of your day. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye. For now.